Nicholas, from my days as a neuroscientist and knowing many neuroscientists, the large majority of them certainly feel that everything about the mind can be explained ultimately by the brain. Yet the majority of philosophers, forget theologians, think that in principle that is forever impossible. You say that in the strong sense, when we know everything about the brain, we will know the entirety of consciousness. How could you be so sure? Well, it's, I suppose you, I would agree with you, it's an article of faith, but it's pretty well-grounded faith. I'm a materialist. I believe that in the end, matter is all that makes up this extraordinary world we live in. Um, and I'm also a Darwinist. I'm a, I believe in the theory of natural selection and that the extraordinary thing which constitutes the human mind and the brain has come about through a slow process of of improvement by uh, because of the consequences, the way the brain worked was having better and better results for the animals which 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 had those brains. So it follows in that case that if the brain and the, if the mind has evolved, it's evolved because of the effect effects it has in the world. Um, if it doesn't have any effect on the world, natural selection can't have seen it, and therefore there's no way in which it could have been selected for. Um, so if consciousness had no material consequences, it wouldn't be there, or it certainly wouldn't have evolved. If it does have material consequences, it must have them because it's influencing our behavior, our behavior in many complex ways. Not only, of course, you know, the things we, everyday actions we take, but the thoughts which lead to different kinds of actions, our loves and beliefs and are being awestruck in the presence of God, whatever it may be, they're all consequences which have real world effects. Now, if consciousness and the mind is producing changes in behavior, then the only thing it can do, the only way it can be doing that is by influencing the material organ, which is the brain. Um, and so uh, whatever is a, you know, material causes produce material effects and nothing else does, unless you believe in kind of some kind of Cartesian dualism. So we have to assume that in the end, everything which we manifested in our own experience as consciousness and mindfulness must be a function of our material brain. Most people would agree with at least the first part of that description. But when you think hard about what the brain is, a uh, um, very large number of, of neural impulses, a little electrical activity, 100 billion neurons, maybe 10,000 different connections, each one's a huge number of permutations. But at the end of the day, it's electrical charges moving along mm -hmm. these neurons, uh, chemicals exchanged between the neurons. And the fundamental question of philosophers is, how can a sequence of neurons uh, in their electrical activity literally be the seeing of red, uh, the, the smell of, uh, of, um, of cheese, uh, all the different sensations of, of music. Uh, how, how can literally one be the other? It seems like that's a vast and obvious category mistake. It depends how you want to describe the experience. If, as I would do, I say that everything, all our experiences, actually in some, at some level can be re-described in terms of being a representation of something as something else. Um, we you know the experiences we have may seem magical and strange, but we can describe them in the end in a language which relates to real things in the world. Um, we may not do it perfectly yet, but in the, in the end we're going to be able to. Those, that means that uh, everything which we call experience this is not going to be in a different category from the things which we, in the going on in the brain, which we equally can describe in terms of other things in the world. So we're going to have an equation in which one set of descriptions is going to have to map onto another set of descriptions yeah. on the other side. We'll give you the descriptions at some point in time will be perfect that you'll have a direct correlation in the brain between that smell of cheese or the visual ex experience of red with a sequence of, of neuronal activities in, in all, all of its glorious detail. If, if we give e each other that, still there's a profound question that it, it just seems so different that it, it, it seems incredible that one would be the other. You could have the neuronal impulses registering on a computer causing a certain uh, behavior. 
But to say the experiences that we have literally are those neural impulses seems bizarre. So our experience is the way we represent something which is going on inside our brain. And in fact, I think that we literally create an extraordinary kind of art object, a mysterious object or an activity, a mathematical activity in our brain, which we then represent to ourselves in our mind as having these mysterious properties which seem so inexplicable. And if they in fact, and as they seem indeed to be out of this world, but that's because we are indeed the subjects of an illusion, a wonderful illusion in which we've been set up by our own brains to think we're in the presence of something which doesn't translate into the ordinary world, mundane world we live in. So when philosophers point out that, yes, consciousness seems to have out of this world qualities and therefore the, bridge, the gap can't be bridged, I'd say yes, exactly, and that's the point. Um, where we've been, we've evolved to have experiences which seem to us to be out of this world and uh, inexplicable by, uh, by, by ordinary scientific means. But that doesn't mean they are. Let me give you an analogy. Um, we can create an object. Uh, for example, there's a famous illusion called the Penrose Impossible Triangle, um, which looks for all the world as if it's a triangle which is joined up in a way which doesn't physically make sense. I'm sure many of your viewers will know it. Now, it was first created simply as a drawing, um, and easy enough to do that because it's drawn on flat paper. But the psychologist Richard Gregory realized that this could actually be created in real life. And he set about to make a wooden model, which when seen from one particular position, has exactly the property of seeming to us to be impossible. Um, we represent this object as having qualities, uh, features, which it actually can't have. Now, I think this is, in some ways, a very interesting analogy for what we're doing when we create consciousness. We're creating something in our mind which, when we see it from just that one special position, the privileged position of the subject of, of our mind, then we see it as having properties which apparently don't make sense to us. Um, but why shouldn't that be an illusion just like the... Uh, real Penrose Triangle, the real impossible triangle. And once you realize that we don't have to say that consciousness actually is the thing it seems to be, which would be impossible and impossible to explain, but only seems to us to have those qualities, then what we have to do is to explain why it seems to us to have those properties. And that changes the game. Um, it makes it, the puzzle then is to see how we could have been tricked into representing things that way. And of course, you know, there's a lot more work to do after that, but at least we've moved the problem on to a different level. At least the hard problem problem seems now to be something to, to which we have an entree. Nick, allow me a thought experiment. You have developed your theory of consciousness based upon your prior strength of belief in naturalism and materialism. If I were to take that away from you, and give you a neutral position on naturalism versus supernaturalism. Not, not a believing in supernaturalism, but a neutral position. How would then you approach consciousness? I'd approach it by uh, making a choice between naturalism, which is a satisfactory explanation of the world because it allows us to see the origins of the forces which exist in nature, and supernaturalism, which is just an ad hoc hypothesis, which could explain anything. If you have to choose, of course, I'd go for the first, which is satisfying, uh, beautiful, uh, and in the end uh, can deliver in a way in which the supernaturalist hypothesis can't. If you were neutral on it, not that you had a, a, a supernatural hypothesis or a natural, just say it was neutral, it was off the table, how would your approach to consciousness change? Robert, I think I wouldn't be doing it. I'm in this game because I want to find a natural explanation. And that's what motivates me. Um, it's the joy of discovering how the world works within a consistent framework which runs across, right across nature, which drives this exploration on.